Good morning and welcome to worship at Second Presbyterian Church. Although many are vaccinating, we ask you to keep your mask on at all times and maintain social distance. For the passing of the peace, simply nod or bow or wave to each other. Since our service is being recorded, we ask you to remain in your pews until after the postlude is concluded. And as you exit, we ask you to leave your gifts and donations in the offering plates provided. Uh, we are coming out of the pandemic, hallelujah, but we're still cautious. And so help us keep this safe space, the sacred space safe for all. Let us worship God. Sisters and brothers, arise, arise and lift your hearts. Arise and lift your eyes, arise and lift your voices. The living, moving spirit of God has called us together. We gather in witness, in celebration, in struggle. Reach out toward each other, for our God reaches out toward us. The wind of the spirit is blowing. Let us worship God and respond with joy.
us to be one, to live in unity and one. Yet we are divided, race from race, faith from faith, faith, from faith rich from poor, old from young, neighbor from neighbor. Old Lord, from neighbor. Old Lord Declaration of the pardon. Hear the good news in which we are baptized. Christ has made known to us that we are fully forgiven. Because Christ reveals his truth, we have peace the offer. Because Christ loves us holy, we have love God. Because we are touched by mercy, we have grace to share. All glory and praise to God. Prayer of illumination. Holy God, author of all wisdom, we come to your word, gratitude, and humility. Grant us the fullness of the mind to assist us in the understanding. Grant us the sensitivity of your heart to receive what we hear. Grant us the willingness of spirit to live out our faithful response each day. We pray this to the spirit. Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seeds in his field. For a while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the household came and said to him, Master, did you not sow seeds? So good seeds in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered. An enemy has done this, the slave said to him. Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, and gather the wheat into my barn. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 36 through 43. Hear the word of God. 
Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his, as his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. The word of God for the people of God.
I grew up in Oklahoma and never once heard about the Tulsa massacres growing up. Not in Oklahoma history in high school, not in American history in college. In fact, many Tulsans don't even know what happened in 1921, but in the last few weeks, the knowledge of this devastation has come upon us. An African-American man tripped in an elevator, inadvertently touching a white woman who was operating the elevator. Most accounts say the elevator lurched or he mistakenly stepped on her shoes. Police arrested the man accusing him of assaulting a white woman. When concerned, black men went to the courthouse with guns to prevent a lyn lynching. White residents retaliated with overwhelming force. A white mob destroyed 35 blocks of Black Wall Street, demolishing and burning down one of the wealthiest areas of town in the process, killing up to 300 individuals, injuring 1,000, and displacing 6,000 people into state-run detention centers. Black community leaders were compelled by the Tulsa mayor to say that the blacks were the cause of riots to blame for the destruction. No one was ever brought to trial or prosecuted for this time. No investigation, no due process. No one ever offered anything by way of compensation for life and limb lost. Businesses burned down, homes destroyed, savings eliminated, dreams set back for decades. The whole episode, was, whole episode was based on a lie or a fabrication. It's good to remember the difficult truth of what happened in Tulsa. People of color relive memories of trauma's past, despair of justice and await the next flow while the larger white population ignores what happened. Now we hear that the mayor of Tulsa offered an apology to the descendants, but this is as far as it goes. There will be no considerations, the mayor said, of reparations from the state or city council. Did you know at the same time the Oklahoma State Legislature has approved a ban on critical race theory being taught at the high school and collegiate level. They deem critical race theory because it seems to divide blacks from whites. It seems to blame race, one race for the misfortunes of others. It seems to bring the past into the present. They say, we're teaching our kids to hate our country. One man wrote in the Tribune recently that teaching our impressionable children that this country is basically racist and was founded by racist distorts history. We have to ask what about history is being distorted. Since the very first days when slaves were brought to Jamestown Colony in 1617, Isabel Wilkerson writes, there's been a caste system in America. White supremacy was our official national policy up until 1865 and has still become an unofficial policy for many. Why is critical race theory such a threat? It holds racism is part of a broader pattern in America woven into our laws and into the fabric of our society in details large or small. But when educational bills that outlaw teaching this theory come up and they've been passed in Tennessee and Florida, they're being considered in 10 other states. We have to see that some people are trying to control the teaching of American history to serve their own group in power. Who has the most to gain by voting in these educational policies? Well, most teachers are protesting, did you know? We have many teachers in our congregation. 
They're saying the restrictions based on teachers in the classroom will seriously distort what occurred in America's past and present a complete and incomplete and biased view of history. Because I keep up with my hometown Oklahoma newspaper, I know that no one in high school or college classrooms will be able to talk about this critical race theory. Students won't really be allowed to think about group crimes or study majority treatment of minorities. Classes are being canceled. Professors are being warned. It's the worst kind of censorship. Jesus gave a perfect parable that opens up to us our understanding about what's going on in this exact moment of our history. The master went out and sowed seeds of wheat one day, not that his servants sowed it, but the master sowed good seed by him, seed by seed. And while everyone was asleep, an enemy came in under cover of stealth and planted weeds among the wheat then went away and when they started to germinate and grow a few weeks later they found weeds populating the field weeds that threatened the good seed and kept it from growing weeds that might kill off the crop and they asked the master what happened to the good seed and the master said it must be the end who sowed these pernicious weeds since it's impossible to uproot and pull out a stalk of uh, weed without disrupting the soil around the weed. The only thing you could do is wait until harvest. Wait until the time of harvest when work, workers will have to separate the weed from the weed and bundle up the weeds so that a good crop of weed can be harvested. In other words, it's a lot of work. Do you see the parallel? At this precise moment in our American story, when seeds of racial justice are growing and ready to produce new consciousness, someone's coming in overnight hoping that we're asleep, trying to write laws that will arrest our growth and return us to the understanding of years back and back. This parable, as all Jesus' parables, are about imagining God's kingdom. God commands us to love God. With all our minds, God calls us to a faith that seeks understanding. The church is the intellectual community, and we're always teaching and learning and growing in faith, and we're always using our minds to discern God's word and will in our lives. It's incumbent upon Christians to sift through the ideas and values of our culture and determine when good seeds are being sown and determine when seeds are being sown with evil intent. It's incumbent upon us of the Christian faith to embrace the intellectual integrity that Jesus the Christ gives us. Our faith is based on Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus claims our minds and hearts through the seeds that he plants within our everyday life. And if you know the same Jesus that I know, Jesus won't allow us to traffic in anything that's untrue. Jesus won't allow us to preach a gospel that is not part of his redeeming work in the world. First, that means I think we have to be humble. Sometimes our thoughts can become bad weeds instead of good seeds. Sometimes the attitudes that we have can work against God's purposes in history. Sometimes our actions can promote harm and not growth. We always have to ask God to help us and give us insight and clarity and review the seeds that we live out. The seeds we plant and the seeds we hope to harvest. At the same time, it means we have to be bold in the proclamation of our faith. 
In his earthly life, Jesus planted seeds of knowledge, seeds of sacred understanding and interpersonal healing, seeds of inclusiveness and welcome of the stranger, seeds of racial reconciliation and racial unity. All the while he planted seeds, he invited his disciples and followers into a, a deeper awareness of God's kingdom. We have to be bold in planting these same seeds in our day and age. We have to keep cultivating seeds of hope and understanding, keep speaking out about accountability so that we all serve God and we all work for bringing forth justice in our nation. This parable also gives us an urgent imperative to keep weeding out the bad seed when we find it. We know there are people in our society who plant seeds of bad information and seeds of misinformation. Sometimes it sounds good on paper, but at heart it's discriminatory. And it's designed to set other people back. We have to whisk away the bad seed before it starts growing. And that means standing boldly as Christians and speaking the truth about injustice in our society. We cannot allow ignorance and bigotry to reign. We know some churches identify with white supremacy and they don't know it. Some churches preach a Jesus who turns his back whenever racial injustice occurs. Some churches preach a gospel that's more hatred than love. And so it behooves us to do a lot of sparring in engaging our Christian brothers and sisters who fail to remember Jesus first in their words and in their rhetoric. We remember Jesus. We need more of Jesus. We need to pray that Jesus will make Christianity more Christian in our day and time. Don't get me started. <laughs> you know, the final conclusion of this parable is that Jesus says, in the end, the good seed the master plants is going to win out because God is just, Jesus said, the good seed will prevail. The right people will win out. Those who intend evil doing and sin are going to be defeated. When? At the end of time, at the end of the age. But I submit to you, we can't wait until then. We have to begin our work now. People of God, Tulsa matters. 100 years ago and today, what happened in the past still goes on in different forms. Those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Let's allow our teachers to teach the truth. Let's empower our students to learn real history. What we teach our children matters from generation to generation. And if you ask me, it's not political, it's theological. The master has planted the seeds of the kingdom among us and in our midst. It's up to us to help them grow and bear fruit.
historic faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father only. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We welcome you to Second Presbyterian Church on this season of Pentecost and this glorious Sunday. If you're visiting for the first time, we invite you to sign a blue card in the pew and place it in the offering plate as you leave. We are glad that you're here and invite you to join us again and again. For prayer requests, please fill out the yellow registration cards so that we might pray with you in whatever you're going through. We are a church that believes that community is a spiritual practice. In your bulletin, many classes and groups are listed. A stretch class here on Monday mornings, a strawberry farm picking at the end of June, other in-person and online Bible studies and book discussion groups. Please join us and be part of our community and help us extend community to all. In our joys, we celebrate this Thursday begins uh, our seventh hosting of the Farmer's Market, and we uh, look forward to seeing neighbors and friends and vendors and all come together in our north parking lot and promote a sense of neighborliness among them, among ourselves. In our prayers, we remember those who are undergoing treatments for cancer, we hold each person and each family in prayer. We ask for every cure and healing that's possible. And we celebrate the reopening of Chicago and pray for caution and wisdom as we navigate this new phase. We also pray for all those who are unvaccinated still and at risk. And now we continue worship hearing the words from Deuteronomy. See, I have set before you today life and blessing, adversity and curse. Choose life so that you may live.
of the civil rights era and beyond, such as Martin Luther King Jr., Coretta Scott King, Rosa Parks, and John Lewis. We thank you for their voices, leadership, and their actions that continue to inspire countless people today. We remember especially today the victims of the Tulsa racial massacre of 100 years ago, and we pray for their families and descendants. We ask for healing and a recognition of the need to make amends to them and to bear witness to this crime and to call out for justice to God. We remember all who have suffered from the terror and horror of racism. We pray for all who suffer from the evil of racism, that they may receive comfort from you Dear God, we ask you, all-powerful God, that you remind everyone on earth of the great command of your Son, Jesus Christ, to love one another. Lord, we ask you to fill the hearts of those who are twisted with hate and racism, to fill their hearts with love and understanding for their fellow human beings. Infuse in their hearts and minds the truth that we are all human, equal, and beautiful by your creation. We pray this morning that we as a people will get to the promised land that Dr. King spoke of. May it be so, dear God. We pray for the church around the world that it may be a force for justice in the fight against racism and discrimination. We pray for the members and friends of Second Presbyterian Church, that we may be prophets and speak for truth and justice against the disease of racism 
and call it out when we see it. We pray for peace around the world, especially in our own city of Chicago. And now, as our Savior taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. You're going to forgive us our debts, and we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
May your spirit overflow with Jesus' spirit of wisdom and grace. And may you be empowered to plant and grow and cultivate seeds of justice and love. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and communion of the Holy Spirit, companionship of each other, bless you now and keep you forever. All God's people said.